Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Light Field Microscopy Camera Solutions. I am Sabrina of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Teledyne Photometrics. To learn more, visit photometrics.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd now like to welcome our speakers, Professor Liang Gao, Associate Professor, Department of Bioengineering at UCLA, Professor Xu Jia, Assistant Professor, um, the Wallace H. Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering, Dr. Phil Allen, Product Manager, Teledyne Photometrics, and Dr. Matthew Cosset dunn contact, Content Manager at Teledyne Photometrics. Professor Gao, Professor Gia, Dr. Allen, and Dr. Cosset dunn you may now begin your presentation. Hello and welcome to a Teledyne Photometrics webinar all about light field microscopy and how to obtain 3D images in just a single acquisition. We're going to go over what light field microscopy is, as well as the benefits, challenges and applications. This is all supported by two guest speakers who frequently make use of light field microscopy and followed up by my colleague on the Kinetics SCMOS family for light field, as well as some new Kinetics modes that are going to be a big help for advanced imaging users everywhere. First, a bit about who we are at Teledyne Photometrics. We design and manufacture high sensitivity cameras for challenging scientific imaging. So we have a range of solutions to match a range of applications, all the way from things like single molecule imaging to fast dynamic techniques like voltage imaging. We're the market leader for scientific CMOS technologies, and we've been part of the Teledyne Imaging Group since 2019. On this webinar will be myself, Dr. Matthew Kurze dunn the Content Manager and Application Specialist for Teledyne Photometrics. Joining me is also my colleague, Dr. Phil Allen, the Photometrics Product Manager. But most importantly, also speaking on this webinar, are two guest speakers who make frequent use of light field microscopy and are having numerous impacts on the field. These are Professor Liang Gao of the University of California and Professor Xu Zha of the Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory University. Firstly, a bit about light field microscopy, not to be confused with light field, which is a Teledyne software and analysis package by the same name. Light field microscopy was first introduced in 2006 by a group at the Stanford University Computer Graphics Lab. In light field microscopy, the entire light field within the microscope is captured. This contains information of the radiance along the light rays in free space, which results in a four-dimensional function termed the 4D light field. In microscopy, there are numerous techniques that exist to capture different levels of sample dimensionality. These are all techniques that involve some kind of scanning and can collect different amounts of data. So firstly, you have point scanning, something like multi-photon imaging, line scanning for things like confocal, and then plane scanning. This can capture an entire 2D focal plane of the sample. These all involve scanning and examples for each of these techniques are listed below. The next level of this would be volumetric 3D imaging, where a 3D volume can be captured in a single acquisition. This is done with light field microscopy, which is a scanless technique that produces 3D images. The extra information in the light field allows for additional extras, such as digital refocusing and directionality perspective with some deconvolution. So what is the light field? A light field is a distribution of light or radiance from an object, in this case, a microscopy sample. This light field contains intensity, positional and directional information from the sample if the sample is dynamic and in motion. 
In classic wide field or bright field microscopy, light from a single point on the sample is directed to a single point on the camera. This means that the directional and positional information from the light field is lost. The camera mainly captures intensity from select points on the sample. With light field microscopy, there's an additional microlens array before the light hits the camera sensor. This means that light from a single point on the sample can now be directed to different points on the camera. This allows a user to capture more of the 4D light field from the sample from either side of the focal plane by splitting it onto different pixels. This allows you to get more of the 4D light field data than the techniques like wide field. This additional microlens array makes a big difference for things like axial positioning. So in wide field, this is what happens when you focus on deeper planes beyond the focal plane. In light field, the microlens array splits the light from the light field, resulting in distinctive non-overlapping patterns of discrete data points from the different focal planes. This is very useful for imaging into thicker samples, such as whole animals, tissues, or organs, such as the brain. So with light field, you get a 3D image with every capture. You can determine your axial position within a stack, and you can even use the information in the light field to digitally refocus your images after you've captured them. Essentially, the level of data exceeds that of typical microscopy because you're capturing more of the 4D light field. This also works for multiple emitters from the same point on the sample. For wide field, data from a single point overlaps on the camera and data can be lost from multiple point emitters. In light field, the result is a non-overlapping pattern from each emitter within the sample and data from both of them can be retained. This allows you to capture more of the light field and benefit from that extra data. Furthermore, the 4D light field contains data about the directionality of light from different locations on the sample, thanks to capturing all the radiance. These light field microscopy images can be processed to show the sample from different perspectives, or to show what direction a sample is moving in, as we see here from the figure. If you image a series of particles that are moving dynamically in solution, Information from light field microscopy can be used to tell what direction they're moving in, thanks to the multiple perspectives of each particle that you'll have. So in terms of applications for light field microscopy, the main one is 3D volumetric imaging, especially at high speed. So this pairs up well with techniques that require speed in order to capture dynamic samples, such as calcium or voltage imaging. Now you can capture functional signals from neural cells across an entire 3D model organism, such as a C. elegans nematode worm in the figure. You can capture data from the entire animal in 3D, all at high speed. You can also use light field for other applications, such as multi-view imaging of time of flight signals. You can even image at extended depths through occlusions, or image things such as non-linear surfaces in real time. The applications and benefits of light field expand beyond microscopy with a whole field of light field imaging. But even when looking just at microscopy, there are numerous benefits from imaging the light field. To summarize the benefits and challenges of light field microscopy, for the pros, you get a 3D volume with every snapshot. You can digitally refocus these images after you've taken them. You have increased axial resolution and if your samples are moving around, you can also look at their directionality thanks to the perspective data. You can look at multiple 404s and you can do all this at high speed. In terms of the cons or disadvantages, the additional microlenses can result in undersampling due to the microlens sometimes being larger than the camera pixel. This can result in a decrease in lateral resolution and potential artifacts. From the figure we can see what a raw light field microscopy image looks like through the microlens array. However, advances in developing smaller microlenses 
a similar size to the camera pixel would mostly eliminate this disadvantage. The other disadvantage is that light field microscopy generates large data sets that require further processing. Because you're capturing more of the light field, you do have more data and you need to deconvolve or process this data often to achieve information on directionality. However, the generation of large data sets and their need for further computational processing is a very common problem across many techniques in microscopy. But that's enough for me. Let's hear from our light field microscopy experts, Professors Liang Gao and Xu Zha. My name is Liang Gao. Uh, I'm assistant professor at bioengineering department at UCLA. So my lab mainly focuses on building light field microscopes, endoscopes, all kinds of imaging instrumentation for medical and biological applications. My name is Xu Jia. I'm currently an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at Georgia Tech and Emory University. So our research is mainly about biophotonics, and we develop uh, new types of microscopy techniques, uh, computational tools, and also uh, imaging systems. So light field imaging is different from conventional photography. For example, for the conventional photography imaging, it will only capture the light intensity information at each spatial pixels. But for light field imaging, it's captured both the spatial information and angular information. So we call it a four-dimensional data cube. And we can, using the computational imaging techniques, to transform this four-dimensional light field data cube into a three-dimensional image. So this is actually an advantage of light field imaging compared with the conventional scanning-based 3D imaging approaches like this confocal or multi-photon microscopy because light field imaging basically captures the three-dimensional image by a single snapshot. It has this big advantage in the imaging speed. For the type of light field microscopy we are working on, um, we use an array of micro lenses in our microscope, which can distribute light into different locations of the camera sensor, which can capture both the spatial information and the angular information of incoming light. And uh, we call this 2D spatial and 2D angular information. So with this 4D light field information, computationally, we can reconstruct the full 3D volume of the uh, object. As you can see, uh, with just a one camera frame, now you have both the spatial and the angular information. So you don't really need uh, scanning in your data acquisition. So basically one camera snapshot, then you can reconstruct the full 3D volume. So that means you can really image your object, especially 3D object, at very high speed. Uh, which is primarily limited by your camera speed. And so this is very useful, especially when you are looking at very fast volumetric uh, biological information, dynamics, and structures. My lab mainly focuses on trying to further increase the imaging speed of life in microscopy. Just as I mentioned, conventional light field imaging captures this uh, four-dimensional data set which is tremendous in data size. Because in the light field microscopy, we're still using these conventional 2D sensors to measure the spatial and angular information. So when the data size is very big, then the readout speed of the cameras becomes slow because these two actually you know, inversely proportional to each other. And in my lab, we're trying to using this compressed sensing technique as well as trying to correlate these different perspective images in the light field mic microscopy and using these two methods, we can significantly reduce the data redundancy in the light, light field microscopy. So we can still keep the image quality of this conventional light field imaging, but you know, increase the imaging speed by orders of magnitude. So our technique we call light field tomography, or short as lift. Using, using this lift technology, we, we can image you know, at the trillions of frames per second for this ultra-fast imaging we can do kilohertz, this kind of frame rate for light field microscopy, which is you know, critical needed in these uh, neuron imaging applications. We do in vivo imaging. So basically we put the mouse under our microscope and uh, we open a transparent window on the mouse skull and directly access these neurons you know, using our microscope. 
But currently, we are interested to look at the similar activities in the deep brain regions, mainly in the hippocampus. And we also want to keep the mouse, you know, still awake during the imaging because anesthesia can greatly suppress this neural activity. The sensor we use is the GVI sensors. So it's a genetically encoded voltage sensor. So for the current workouts of this neural imaging, people normally using the calcium sensors like GCAM. But the problem is that, you know, GCAM is have relatively slow response. Also, it's correlated with these neural activities, but it does not reflect every neuron spiking events. But using these GVI sensors, it has these milliseconds, this temporal response. So we can potentially get these every single pulsing events in every each neurons. But again, these pulsing events is very transient, normally at these milliseconds time scales. Using conventional these light field microscopes, they cannot capture that because the frame rate is limited by the data size of light field. And using our approach, we can just break this bottleneck and uh, push the light field about this uh, microscopy technique into the next level. So light field uh, microscopy has now been applied to different aspects of uh, research, especially in uh, uh, bioimaging. So at the larger scale, it's been widely used for uh, brain imaging, especially to image brain functionality activities in real time. And also uh, for my lab, we are particularly interested in uh, because this is highly scalable, we are particularly interested to scale it down to image single cells. So now we can image uh, the volume of single cells um, at the diffraction limit. And also people have tried to push on one hand the spatial resolution to super resolution. And also on the other hand, people have tried to push the, uh, the reconstruction, the computational efficiency by combining uh, different algorithms as well as deep learning. So uh, what I can see is it can be applicable to many different types of biological model systems mm. from molecules, single molecules, single cells to tissues. Um, and also people have Im imaged uh, living animals. So it, it is really uh, highly scalable. So uh, I believe with all these developments, uh, it will be very applicable in the future. So I think for light field microscopy, the most challenging part is photon redundancy. As I mentioned, normally light field microscopy, microscopy generate tremendous size of data size. So it's not only pose a challenge on this data transfer from the camera to the host computer, and also pose a huge challenge on the data storage and the management. And so this is why we, we decided to try and look at different approaches to assess this light field microscopy and uh, reduce these uh, data during, during the data acquisition and improve these uh, you know, image reconstruction qualities without sacrificing this uh, imaging speed. You can see this is uh, uh, a computationally heavy technique because now you are projecting the entire three-dimensional information onto a two-dimensional camera sensor. So you do have a lot of information on a 2D image. Okay, so how to reconstruct your 3D information without artifacts and with uh, good computational efficiency. So at the very beginning, uh, when we reconstruct the 3D volume, uh, uh, we, we based on a re-optics model, uh, which of course compromised the, uh, uh, the spatial and angular information, right? So that uh, the microlens array actually limits the, uh, the spatial resolution you can get. And later on, uh, people have developed a wave optics model to uh, reconstruct the, uh, the 3D volume, which considers light diffraction uh, as it propagates through the imaging system. So with um, better and better algorithms nowadays, uh, we can recover uh, most of the information compared to, for example, uh, IP fluorescence microscopy, wide field or uh, confocal microscopy. And for our application, speed is a key. So we want to image something really fast. Light field microscopy can give us this 3D imaging capability. But the 3D imaging speed is still fundamentally limited by this readout speed of the camera. So this is why we are very interested in looking for you know, these high-speed cameras, which have offered this high resolution at the same time at this high readout speed. And also, most importantly, we want these sensors to have very low noises 
because of the GVI imaging, the, all, we are almost reached this uh, photon short noise limit. For each pixel, we only have uh, maybe tens of or hundreds of photons at most. So we require these sensors to be extremely sensitive and can be operated in these uh, low light conditions. So this is why we think that you know, our current Teledyne is Kinect cameras is perfect fit for application because it's offered is a high readout speed, low noise, high sensitivity, and also it's offered these uh, multiple range and readout functions, which is also critical for our application because for our technique, we are instead of reading the full sensor format, we only read out selected lines. And the Kinex cameras is actually the only camera on the market can offer this function. So camera is, is very important for light field microscopy. So uh, because uh, the time resolution or how fast you can image an object is just limited by the, the camera speed. So as you can see, uh, if you have a larger camera sensor, uh, well, without compromising the, uh, the acquisition speed, the camera frame rate, then that would be great. So, um, so in our setup, we, 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 we typically use scientific CMOS camera, which can run at 100 hertz or 10 millisecond uh, exposure time uh, for the full sensor, full chip. Um, and I mean, if we want to go faster, uh, for this camera, we need to compromise some of the field of view. So we need to uh, reduce the lines that, that, we, uh, that we image uh, to in, improve the speed. But if we can have a camera um, with a larger sensor, with a higher speed, uh, so that we can enhance our field of view uh, well, without lo losing any uh, temporal resolution. So that would be, that would be great. A good uh, aspect for a light field microscopy is, uh, as you can see, it's, uh, uh, you, you capture a 4D light field, and then computationally, you reconstruct the 3D volume. So in this case, your spatial scales like field of view, spatial resolution is independent from your temporal resolution. Okay, so this is a very good property. Um, a lot of time we call it, this is highly scalable. Mm -hmm. So because light field micros microscopy can be such highly scalable, uh, that means that if you have a larger sensor, okay, you can enlarge your field of view or enhance the, uh, the volume that you can image without losing your speed. So this is definitely uh, a, very good, a very good property to, to have. I think, um, yeah, developing advanced cameras will be very helpful for uh, light field microscopy because this is a type of microscopy that's heavily relying on this single camera frame. So, so whatever you can contain in a single camera frame uh, determines how much you can reconstruct into the 3D volume. So a better camera would definitely be uh, uh, be uh, helpful uh, to uh, light field microscopy. So yeah, we, we will be very excited to, to see new cameras uh, coming out for light field imaging. So I think a major direction for light field imaging is to expand its functionalities. Currently, light field microscopy can only capture this light intensity in 3D image, but we want to expand this functionality to multiplex imaging so we can capture not only light intensity information, but also the spectral information, the polarization information, and also the fluorescence lifetime information. If we have such, you know, huge amount of information available cap can be captured, you know, in combination with the light field data acquisition, then we have these uh, very unique capabilities to image multiple chromophores in the uh, same time. This is actually very important for the neuron imaging applications. Because neuron scientists, they are not only interested in look at this neuron pulsing, they also want to look at these interactions between different neurons. So these are using different labels to label different neuron groups. And only the image modality can offer this multiplex imaging capability, can this uh, you know, imaging multiple group of neurons can be made possible. So regarding that, I think the multiplex imaging is definitely a direction for light field microscopy. On one hand, people have tried to miniaturize uh, such a device, and um, by integrating uh, uh, advanced manufacturing and also uh, uh, small camera sensors, 
so that you can make a really small light field microscopes um, uh, just to make them variable for uh, animal imaging uh, in real time. And also, on the other hand, um, yeah, we like to see that at the cellular level, um, it can reveal many of the dynamics or this, uh, the structures that haven't been studied before uh, due to the this spatial temporal compromise uh, of other types of microscopy tools. So I hope, um, I mean, with live field microscopy, we can, uh, we can explore uh, many unknown regions of uh, biological dynamics um, in the future. Many thanks again to Professors Liang Gao and Xu Jia for their perspectives on light field microscopy. Such a technique requires a powerful yet flexible camera in order to make the most of the microscopy benefits. Here, I'll hand over to my colleague, Dr. Phil Allen, to discuss good camera solutions for light field microscopy imaging systems. Hello. Thanks to the speakers for their insights into light field microscopy, and thank you, Matt, for the introduction. To all of you, I'm Phil Allen. I'm a product manager for Teledyne Photometrics. In previous positions, I've been both an academic researcher building FRET-based biosensors to address live cell function and manage several microscopy cores. So uh, I've got quite an uh, interest in microscopy and the various techniques being applied to it. I want to talk to you today about camera requirements for light field and some of our cameras that we think uh, provide unique solutions for the light field imaging approach. So to borrow a slide Matt used in the back in the beginning, just a quick comparison again between wide field and light field. Light field microscopy steers the photons that originate in different Z positions to different XY positions on the sensor. In contrast, different Z positions in wide field just end up at different blobs when they hit the sensor, but in the same X, Y center. If our goal is to use light field imaging as a fast volumetric measure of the sample, we need to collect this data with precision, speed, and accuracy. So using light field approaches, we're really even much more constrained by the parameters of the camera than we are with regular wide field, because we need all the normal requirements of high sensitivity, low noise, and appropriate pixel size to match the optics sampling. But because now we're using multiple pixels for one point from the sample, we need more pixels. And as you heard from the speakers, the bigger the field of view of the sensor, the more the sample one can capture. We're also spreading signal from volumes above and below the focal plane to multiple pixels, reducing the photons that any one pixel sees. And lastly, to recreate the three-dimensional image from our light field microscope, math has to happen. I won't delve into that. I'm in no way an expert. But math can be rather distracted by noise. So the better the signal to noise of our collected image, the better the result. So with that in mind, I want to introduce you, if you don't know them already, of our Kinetics family of cameras and how appropriate they are for light field. The Kinetics has the largest field of view of any scientific CMOS camera on the market, with a maximum quantum efficiency of, of around 95% and low noise, and it can also do 500 full frames a second readout of its 10 megapixel sensor. There's the full Kinetics of 29 millimeter field of view and the Kinetics 22, which has a reduced field of view, more appropriate for those of you who use CMOT connections to match the rest of your optical setup. In the next few slides, I'll talk about some of the ways to use the camera and compare them with the rest of the competition. So let's think about field of view. I mentioned a 29.4 millimeter field of view. So if you think about a classic EMCD, electron multiplying CCD or a CCD, they were hard to make big, so a common CCD size is maybe 11 millimeters. The standard scientific CMOS stretches out to about 18 or 19 millimeters. The Kinetics and the Kinetics 22 stretch out to 22 and 29. So for the Kinetics, you get 2.4 times the area of a typical CMOS, 2.4 times the information from your sample, and 6.5 times larger than your EMCD. So you've got larger throughput of your sample to become data, which ideally becomes results when you publish your paper. So you get to capture more in every frame. The camera has four modes, and we think these make the camera the most flexible and the precise camera on the market. So 
it has a high dynamic range mode that can go at 83 full frames per second. That would be 83 full frames per second in the full size kinetics for 10 megapixels. It has a sensitivity mode for slightly lower read noise, higher collection efficiency, and slightly better speed. And it has speed mode. Speed mode is when you really need to measure fast processes quantitatively. Imagine cardiac muscle contraction. Imagine voltage changes in neurons as action potentials run down an axon. The speed mode can go 498 frames per second. And we have a sub-electron readout mode for those of you who can take the time to really get very precise data with less than a one electron read noise, about 0.7. So let's think about this again if we want to look at voltage and detect action potentials. And we'll talk about this in two of the modes, dynamic range and speed modes. If you need dynamic range mode, because for example, your voltage sensor has very little contrast, very little min max with the voltage change, and therefore you need to collect a lot of photons to measure that precisely. In the full frame, dynamic range mode goes 83 full frames a second. What does that get you how much space from the sensor can you get if you really want to go at 500. So if you're a standard CMOS, you can do something about this. Pretty thin stripe. If you then go to the kinetics in dynamic range mode, it is going to be six and a half times larger area, six and a half times more rows. So more of your sample, same full well, but more sample at the 500 frames per second. Let's talk about speed mode, 500 frames a second. So for a typical CMOS in a fast mode, we get 11 times greater area between the competition's S CMOS and the kinetics in speed mode. So you can see everything your microscope's outputting, not just a thin strip. <clears throat> and if you remember what our speakers said, in light field imaging, the bigger the sensor, the bigger the sample volume you can measure. And so you can see clearly here, you can get a huge amount of the sample measured. What if we want to go faster than that 500 frames a second? We can start moving towards extreme speeds. As I said, 500 full frames at full 10 megapixels, but what if we start reducing by doing less rows? So we could, for example, take it down to half the width and go 1,000, 2,000 at a quarter width, 4,000 at 3,200 by 800 rows, and if you really pushed it down to a two-line readout, like a line scan camera, you can go greater than 100,000 frames per second. So let's talk about light field and region detection. Light field imaging results in a bunch of discrete spots to recreate the sample. Sampling may require high speeds, but light field data is not always imaged across the entire sensor. So if you could take multiple regions of interest, cartooned here in red, across three cells and a collection of neurons, we could naively go a lot faster and take a lot less data. And so I want to tell you about a pre-beta version of our new multi-ROI functionality. And the idea is this. In our existing cameras, you could reduce data by, for example, taking these three blue regions of interest, organized here in two different configurations. But if all three regions don't lie on basically the same amount of rows, for example, in this right side cartoon, you have to take all the rows in between the region. And so it gives you what I call a bounding box constraint. You still have to collect all of the data even if you're going to throw away what's not in the region of interest. So you do get a frame rate speed up by collecting only this red box, but it's not as good as you would get by collecting this red box. So in our new approach, we are going to be skipping the empty rows. And the idea, same cartoon here, is we'll create two regions. We'll only read out these two regions, and we'll skip regions above and below that aren't relevant to your science. This uh, feature is actively in development and current performance allows five regions of interest that can go the full width of the sensor. 
right now we can go up to 50 rows in each region. And with those 50 rows and five of them, we can go faster than a thousand frames per second. As I said, this is currently in development, but we can all start thinking about what we might do with something like this. So we might just want to reduce data and increase speeds, or we might be able to do something interesting. Like maybe we could have a fast filter switching or different optical configurations to steer, let's say red up here and green down here. Or we could take one of the advances recently in multifocal imaging systems and put one focal depth here and one focal depth here. And I leave that up to your imagination. And please tell us what you think you might would do with such a feature like this. So in summary, we might take this region of interest of our neurons and be able to sample the network behavior of these three neurons with only collecting the regions of interest so we get less data. And because we're only measuring these three regions and skipping in between, we have faster sampling. So to finish, I just want to give you a, a quick reminder of the specifications of the Kinetics and the Kinetics 22. So a minimum of a 0.7 electron read noise, 95% quantum efficiency in the peak, 3,200 by 3,200 for the kinetics, 2,400 by 2,400 for the kinetics, 22, six and a half micron pixels. These six and a half micron pixel size is pretty nice for everything from 60 or so high NA oil immersion objectives all the way down through 10X air objectives. Speeds at 500 hertz at 3,200 by 3,200 in speed mode. And the field of view is 29 millimeter diagonal for the kinetics, 22 millimeter diagonal for the kinetics, 22. And in my opinion, these are the most flexible, powerful scientific cameras for imaging in the biosciences. And with that, I'll hand you back to my colleague, Matt, who will finish up our presentation. Thank you for your interest. Thanks again to Phil for taking us through the benefits of the Kinetics SCMOS family for light field microscopy. To end, I'd just like to highlight how light field microscopy is on the rise. Here we can see a rapid increase in publications featuring light field microscopy since its debut in 2006. This increase in research interest is partly due to the access to new and improved imaging technologies. Teledyne Photometrics introduced the world to back illuminated SCMOS camera sensors in 2016 with the Prime 95B, the world's first back illuminated SCMOS camera, which gave a great benefit to SCMOS sensitivity. Photometrics then advanced to the next generation in CMOS cameras with the Kinetic CMOS in 2019. With these advances in camera technologies, there can also be advances in microscopy technologies. So with the latest and modern camera technologies available and constantly improving, every technique serves to reap the benefits of improved imaging. Our guest speakers are also directly and recently contributing to the rise of light field microscopy, both with recent publications concerning light field imaging and the many different directions this technique can develop in. In summary, light field microscopy is a powerful technique that can produce 3D volumetric images with a single snapshot. Light field imaging therefore excels at high speed 3D imaging, particularly for calcium or voltage imaging in organisms or 3D samples. Light field microscopy is a powerful and versatile technique when paired with the appropriate SCMOS camera, and the Kinetics family presents an ideal solution for light field microscopy and much more. I've been Dr. Matthew Kose dunn from Teleline Photometrics, and I'd like to say many thanks for attending this webinar on light field microscopy. Have a great day, and thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Professor Gao, Professor Gia, Dr. Allen, and Dr. Kose Dunn for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion for the webinar with Dr. Kose Dunn. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located in the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Um, so our first question, um, how does the SNR trade-off with the fast image acquisition in terms of the reconstruction. I'm not sure 
mm. adaptions? This is a this is a great question because while there are a huge amount of benefits to this kind of fast volumetric imaging, it's important to consider that certain reconstruction methods can amplify noise. So the first thing you have to do is to make sure that initially you have as high a signal to noise ratio as possible. So the camera needs to have as high a QE as possible in order to maximize signal collection in the wavelength you're imaging in. And it needs to have a noise contribution as low as possible. This being read noise, shot noise and current noise. Because you're imaging so fast, you can only do that if you're so sensitive. So in order to image at the speeds required for voltage imaging in the kilohertz or thousands of frames per second, you'll need milliseconds of exposure. And the only way to get these milliseconds of exposure is to have a camera that's sensitive enough to pick up the signal in order to image it at a high speed. So maximizing the signal to noise ratio initially at acquisition is very important. And then on the other end, it's important to consider which deconvolution methods you're using in order to reconstruct the image in order to make sure that it's going to amplify the signal and noise in the same ratio or that it doesn't amplify the noise over the top of the signal. So perhaps you need deconvolution and reconstruction methods that involve regularization or methods that are commonly used by others using light field microscopy. Because the good thing is the majority of people will be encountering the same issues in terms of computational cost and running very fast images over a large volume, but trying to maximize the signal to noise ratio while reconstructing the final volume. I hope that goes okay, some way to answering you. your question. Um, thank you. Um, and then our next question, where do you buy the micro lens array? How does this micro lens array um, mounted to the camera and what are the tolerances of this mounting structure? Hmm. I'm not certain about the specifics of where to obtain the array and how to attach it to the system, but it won't be on, it'll be just before the camera itself. So it'll be, uh, if you have a similar optic setup, you'll have maybe some filters or polarization sections in front of the camera. This is rather similar, except you'll have a lens of micro arrays, similar to something you'd use with a super resolution spinning disk system where you'd have a micro lens for every cutout. So you'd need to get one that matches the pixel size of your camera best. So the kinetics is around 6.5 micron pixel. If you have a lens far bigger than that, then you're going to limit your lateral resolution. So find one that matches your camera's pixel and then set it the correct distance away from the camera as you would with any other optical systems. Um, but in order to mount it and get the tolerances off it, I'm not entirely sure, but it shouldn't be too dissimilar to mounting traditional optics or mirrors on a bench. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then our next audience question, do you use FFT for high speed recognition in your setup? Um, by FFT, I am assuming it means fast Fourier transform. I'm not entirely sure. The camera does have an FPGA unit that can do some processing as the data is coming onto the camera and then it's streamed straight to the motherboard by write to disk. Um, in order to determine if it's recognizing things at high speed, the camera is doing the vast majority of the work for you in terms of recognition and acquisition. Later on, you have the data with which you can then put to more computationally assertive tasks like uh, refocusing or reconstruction. Um, but uh, the short answer there is I'm not sure with regards to FFT. But I'd be happy to answer this by email if you get in touch. All right, next one we have here. What are the benefits of the multi ROI on um, the kinetics? So, uh, the kinetics it has a very high speed across 500 frames across the full 
sensor, but in order to do things like voltage imaging, you need a much higher speed. So you need to squeeze down the region of interest to a very small area. If you're able to do this multiple times, you're then able to look more at specific points in your sample. Maybe you don't want to look at the entire field. It's specific neurons you want to pick out. You can look at very specific parts of your sample. This also works well for flow or microfluidics. You often have channels. You can align your readout to each different channel and simply look at particles flow along there. And as Phil mentioned, the uses are kind of bounded by your imagination. But it's essentially rather than having one letterbox, you could have, say, five letterboxes and you'd maintain the speed as if it were one larger letterbox as opposed to one split into five. But the applications for this, are, I'm really interested to see what people are going to use it for. OK, thank you. And then our second to last question here, does light field microscopy need speed? Uh, well, with light field microscopy, you are imaging across a volume. And if you're able to image across a volume, normally with other techniques, you'd spend time imaging so you could then set up a volume. If you can image a volume in one snapshot, you can also unlock the ability to image volumes very fast. And the main applications for imaging volumes very fast would be something like voltage or calcium imaging. Just because you can do light field doesn't mean you have to go at a rapid speed. But considering every, every acquisition acquires a volume, it's often paired with high imaging speed systems so you can get high speed imaging in volumes. Wonderful. And then we did get a few more questions while you were answering that one. Um, so the ones that came in, um, recognize, let's see, recognizing on board can greatly improve the uh, thoroughput. Are you planning to implement such a high level of API implemented on the HW level? So We've implemented a number of things into the FPGA of the kinetics. Uh, we recently partnered with uh, dot photon so that you can have the data compressed up to seven times as it comes off the camera. So there's definitely a wide range of applications for how we can use the processors and the cameras. So you can have these things happen directly in the hardware and take some of the load off your computational system. Uh, as to whether we're planning to do recognition, I'm not entirely sure, but the capability is there for the camera to take some load off the workload by having the FPGA do that. So I'd be more than happy to get in touch and find out some more specifics and see if we have anything in the works or if we can get something in the works because we're part of Teledyne and therefore paired with sensor manufacturers and all sorts of other companies. We have the capability to produce quite a few of these custom systems based on what researchers want to see and what they want to do. Okay, great. Um, and then another one that came in, how fast is the post-processing part for the processing of the image? And how would this relate to on-flight measurements of single cells? Hmm. So in terms of 3D processing, I'm not sure what, if this is in terms of deconvolution, it'll mostly be done post-acquisition because there's quite a high computational load in that you have a lot of data to push through the camera. In terms of 3D processing, the data that comes off the camera is already capable of being in 3D. So if you want to do sort of time on flight measurements of single cells, you can pair light field imaging with something like flow cytometry, and you can see the cells come through at the speed you would normally be able to image at, but you'll be able to process that into a 3D image after the fact, because you have the directional and perspective data. As to whether you can do it on demand, I'm not entirely sure how long it would take, but other 3D reconstruction techniques do seem to be quite time consuming and computationally intensive. So I think you'd be able to capture the image and acquire your cells moving as fast as you could in a light field regime, and then you'd be able to reconstruct the 3D setup of that at the same speed afterwards. So you'd still be able to image things like single cells or even voltage at very high speeds in a volumetric sense without needing to scan, but it wouldn't be coming off the camera in 3D sense. Awesome. And then our last question here, are other modes pl planned for the kinetics? 
Um, so we have a great number of FPGA uh, engineers working on different modes for the kinetics. We recently introduced sub-electron mode. As Phil mentioned, this allows you to push the read noise below one electron. And we have other um, other capabilities in beta, such as uh, frame averaging. There's going to be another webinar later on this year about scattering techniques. And these pair up very well with frame averaging that allow you to look at multiple frames and average the data between them as opposed to frame summing. So there's a lot of capability to do the kinetics and we'll launch all these capabilities as soon as we have them. So we definitely have more planned for this platform because it's proved to be very powerful and the more capabilities we can pack into it, the more advanced images can get out of it essentially. So we have sub electron mode and we'll soon be having multi and there'll be other things in the works as well. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Kose Dunn, do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, not as such, no. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, it's been great to do this presentation and learn about these new exciting techniques that are coming out and allowing things to be imaged that couldn't be imaged before and new capabilities. We're always active on social media and on our website www.photometrics.com. So if you feel like you have a question that hasn't been answered or you want to learn more about the technology or learn more about the cameras, please feel free to get in touch. We're more than happy to chat with anyone and find out how we can help. But beyond that, thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you. And thank you again, Dr. Um, sorry, Professor Gao, Professor Gia, Dr. Allen, and Dr. Kose Dunn for your time today and your presentation. And we would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Teledyne Photometrics, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions, questions we did not have time for today and those submitting during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, have a great day. Goodbye. Thanks very much.